So, um, hello and welcome to Video Cam and Audio Cam for Cam Scotland. My name is Scott Dougherty, and I'm here today with Jane Evans, trauma parenting expert uh, with experience in early years care, foster caring, uh, and parent and family support. Uh, Jane's contributed regularly uh, via the BBC and other publications uh, on the subject of childhood trauma uh, and anxiety and had the honour of uh, being invited to do a TED talk uh, in Bristol uh, recently, which ended up being a, an inspirational discussion about taming our meerkat brain. Um, so welcome, Jane. Hi, great to be with you. Excellent. So we're talking here today about the impact on children uh, when their parents separate, um, particularly where that separation isn't handled carefully by the parents. And to help us understand what might be going on uh, in the, the brains of children uh, in this kind of situation, I wonder if you tell us uh, a little uh, first about brain development uh, and the types of uh, parts of the brain that we need to, to think about in this situation. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's age, age and stage dependent. So if you have very young children and you're going through a separation, the... The, three, the main three parts of the brain, the first part that develops, which is developing even in pregnancy, so from roughly around three weeks after conception, so, you know, if you're going through a separation in pregnancy, you, you need to take, pay, pay good attention to how much anxiety and stress you are absorbing because, which I know is easier said than done in this situation, but the child's survival brain is, is developing at that point. So the survival brain uh, is what it says on the can. It's literally, its only interest is in keeping this alive. It's not an intelligent part of the brain. It doesn't think, it doesn't have skills like that. It's more around um, your basic heart rate, uh, temperature control, breathing. So literally the life preserving um, part things that we need, but also has a link with our fight and flight, which again is going to keep us alive. Okay. And with very young children, that's mostly what, what they're functioning out of. So little babies and early toddlers. Um, the next part of the brain that is beginning to grow a tiny bit in the womb, but, but really starts to grow more after birth, is the kind of middle area of the brain. And um, this has an important role in memory, you know, in short term, long term memory and particularly tying in our emotions to all of that. So, again, you know, think of two year olds <laughs> uh, where they get emotionally overloaded and they end up rolling on the floor. And um, that's because, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's because they, they literally can't help it. They've just got either survival or emotional overload all the two together so you know not being able to have the purple cut feels the same as um, we might feel if we got smashed into by a car it is that intensity of feeling because they don't have much of the most of the upper part of the brain which is hooray where our intelligence lies as such so our ability to think around issues to consider somebody else's point of view, to control our impulses, to have abstract thought, um, you know, that, that starts growing late, later on. And that's actually the part that we parents are developing, particularly in our, in our children. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's it, when we're asking a two year old to go away and think about something or calm themselves down, we're actually asking them to do something that their brain, they don't have enough brain to do it. So good luck with that. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. and, and I think in your, your, your TED talk that I mentioned earlier, you thought up some animals that uh, might help your children understand what's going on. Yeah, um, fortunately, I have a book coming out with them in. So uh, I, I can honestly recommend it as a really simple guide to the brain that you can use with children. It's aimed at kind of two to six, but I honestly, it would be good for adults because it's just so simple. So um, because of the work that I was doing with children and young people, I came up with the idea of this survival brain being like a meerkat. 
So, you know, you, you see the meerkats, if there's a gang of them, there's always one up on a branch that's on lookout and using all its senses to scan the environment for any possible threat, which is what our survival brain does because it's trying to keep us alive. And um, in reality, in real day, in real life nowadays, that there isn't hardly any danger or any threat to us, but we still have this ancient system in us. So nowadays, things like uh, a bad atmosphere in the home. So, you know, if, if a child is growing up in a home where there's a lot of stress, a lot of arguing, a lot of antagonism and bad feeling, although they won't have the intelligent brain to understand that. They will feel it very much in their survival brain and in their survival system in their body. So don't think that young children are not impacted by arguments and fighting and, and all that kind of thing. Sure. Um, and then that middle part of the brain I was talking about, which has this really key role in remembering particularly emotions, um, I think of as an elephant because elephants don't forget. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we don't want to forget, you know, uh, emotional connections to bad memories, particularly because, it, again, it might be life preserving. Mm -hmm. And then the final part of the brain that's that's growing actually uh, until late 20s uh, for women. And for some reason, it's different for men. It's into their 30s. I, I don't know why that is. You make some um, interesting points in your TED talk about that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that's. That's the bit that, you know, is, is like a clever monkey. So some monkeys are nearly as clever as we are. Yeah. And um, it's got social skills. And so that, that's your monkey brain. And, you know, for children, if we can help them to recognize, oh, we're having a meerkat moment. Oh, we've all popped up like little meerkats and we need to get the monkey and help the monkey with all our feelings that the elephant has and, and calm our little meerkat down. And then we can think about this differently. So, so doing things like working out what the little meerkat likes and actually the big meerkats like also, um, you know, just, just helps bring that calmness back because talking to children when they're scared and they're upset and they're confused, it's actually a bit like a woodpecker in your head. You know, it's actually the last thing they need. They need that kind of more basic um, calming of the system. And then you can do talking another time. Well, that's certainly what you talked about uh, fairly recently as well. You, you mentioned um, about a, a programme on Radio 4 about trauma parenting and uh, what developing brains like and don't like. Do you want to expand a wee bit on that? Yeah, um, this was based on a program, a couple of programs that were on channel, f um, sorry, Radio 4, about childhood trauma, which hooray that this is in the mainstream, because, you know, we tend to think of childhood trauma as some massive event, you know, some, you know, which it is, but it's also an ongoing situation for a child in their home. So, um, you know, if a child is living every day of its, of its life, bearing in mind that its brain is developing and it's anxious and frightened and things are very unpredictable and very chaotic, that is experienced in the child's brain and body as, as a level of trauma. So what brains do like is they like calmness. So they like to be near other adults. They like to, brains like brains, essentially. Uh, children do not do well, actually neither do adults, if they're isolated. So, you know, there's been, um, for a long time, there's been a thing about putting children in time out to calm down. Uh, but actually, although some children may just submit to it and, and kind of accept it and suck it up, it's, it's not good for their brain and their system. And also, it teaches them a lesson that when you upset me, you have to go away from me. Whereas actually what brains need when they're upset and they're frightened is they need to, to dock into the docking station and um, access a level of calmness, unpack the emotions, and then they can learn late, you know, later when all that's been done. So thinking about the meerkat elephant monkey, first of all, you have to stroke the meerkat and calm it down so it can relax. Then you have to help the elephant with the feelings. And then when all that's done, 
then you can do some of the monkey stuff and, and talk through the things that are happening. But that might have to be half an hour, an hour, several hours later. Um, so keeping brains very connected and and recognizing, you know, what part is of the brain is my child in? What it, more importantly, <laughs> what part of the brain am, am I in? Yes. So, you know, if we can regulate our own system and our own nervous system and our brains, we're of much more use to a child's brain because obviously it's more underdeveloped and it's going to struggle. So it's really important that whole connection and, um, you know, if you're going through a period of big stress with the separation, then doing a lot of activities with the children that are around breathing and, oh, can you feel the ground? You know, literally grounding yourself and your children as much as you can, doing lots of body-based activities. Sure. So uh, what do you think that being unattached, if I call it that, um, and conscious of parental conflicts, what do you think that can do to the child's brain? Again, if it's not dealt with carefully. Yeah, I mean, it can certainly cause a lot of anxiety in a child. And what we know about anxiety is that actually we have to pay great respect to it. Um, I, I coach, a, you know, quite a lot of adults uh, who have long to all their lives, they have anxiety. This isn't just something that, you know, we can be very anxious and it will just go away, particularly children, because their systems are underdeveloped. So if we keep switching on their meerkat, 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 then the meerkat will be on more than it's off which will often come out in difficult behaviors. So, you know, um, having, having very emotional responses to things, seemingly unresist, unreasonable resistance or unreasonable demands or, um, you know, all sorts of really complex behaviors, which when you're in the middle of going through a separation can just feel like a bridge too far. But actually, you really do need to down tools and strip life back and make it as simple as possible and be more emotionally available to your to your child at a time like this um, because you know what the practical no, no child in the land is going to hold you to account for not having a holiday yes. but they will hold you to account maybe later on for the fact that you were not emotionally present in their lives and and I know how hard that is I, I've been through a divorce it's really not easy yes yes so, so are you saying then that if you are able in some way to reduce the level of conflict that your, your kids are exposed to uh, during or after separation, um, and if maybe you look at your own uh, meerkat brain, that can help? Yeah, I, I would definitely advocate um, anyone who's going through a separation to be getting support somewhere you know often it, it's better to get support from a professional mm -hmm. because uh, your friends your family will have some kind of emotional tie into it and so their their advice and support will have some kind of bias yes. which isn't always helpful you know you don't always want to see the other points person's point of view if it's presented to you by a family member sure. uh, you just want their loyalty not interested um so i think having a safe space with somebody I, I i believe myself in in paying for that safe space i find if i pay people i show up in a very different way <laughs> than uh, if it's just offered to me via the doctor or whatever sure. um, yeah having that safe space and somewhere somebody to give you a structure for this emotionally never mind the practical stuff but you know and really looking at so how is this working out between you and your child because it's so easy to be distracted because you're under so much pressure whichever side you are you both need this and you need this actually this responsibility and bringing it back to the child because you want to have a relationship with them forever you might be separating from your partner but the relationship that you must prioritize and you will want to is the one with your child so coming back to that in in the midst of all the conflict is is the most essential thing yeah uh, and, and you mentioned again in your TED talk about what might happen if you don't do things like that um, seeking outside assistance and only dealing with the, the surface areas like residence and contact custody and access if you don't deal with what's underneath the bonnet um, 
what, what, how can that affect children as the years go on? Well, children are utterly, utterly incredible. If I've learned nothing in, in my years on this planet, uh, what I have learned is, is how much they take on board and how they often accidentally find ways to self-soothe. So if you're living in meerkat mode a lot of the time and life is very unpredictable and, and mum and dad are fighting and then mum or dad is crying a lot, uh, you start making up your own version. You know, you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. So children start pulling their own pieces of the puzzle in, which usually equates to them blaming themselves. And, um, you know, without out getting the, the, the right support and the right holding through this, then they often accidentally find ways to self-soothe. And nowadays, the biggest, easiest way, I will just pull it from my back pocket. Yeah. Okay. So that becomes like medication. And that's for us too. Um, you know, when you, when you are very stressed and then you find something that gives it actually releases a feel good chemical called dopamine. So it might be food. It might not, it might be overeating. It might be under eating. It might be picking at their skin, pulling their hair out, um, risk taking behaviors, uh, for older children, it might be cigarette smoking, um, cannabis, uh, again, dangerous behaviors, but screens are very accessible. And you know, when we're going through a lot of stress it's quite handy, if you can slip your child a screen while you just fill out that form or just make that phone call or just phone your friend to offload. But, um, but just beware because a child is trying to, is trying to anesthetize themselves to the, the chaos and the stress. Sure. Um, and that they will find something. So you think some of these behaviours, um, would you see them automatically or are these the kind of behaviours that would develop over time and you wouldn't really see until later on? Um, I could probably walk into someone's home and, <laughs> and tell them quite quickly what all of them are doing to self-soothe. Um, I, th I think as a parent, and, and I am a parent, you're less likely to realise it you know, and, and what we tend to do is pass on our bad inadverted or unhealthy habits to our children. So be careful of the conversations that you have around your children, particularly at these sensitive times. So uh, a lot of people discuss, you know, we, we're obsessed with weight loss in this country. We're not very good at it, but we talk about it morning, noon and flipping night. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you're talking in front of your children at a time of great vulnerability about, oh, if I was just thinner or I was just this, they will, they're like little radars and um, they will start picking up on this stuff. So it's really important to be careful what you do put their way and just, just to be noticing particular habits they have whether they're repeating, repeating, and how upset they get if they can't have a screen. So if it's just normal bit of grumbling, that's normal. But if it's really high end, you know, meltdowns, or um, if they're overeating, under eating, so it's just really being very present in your child's life at every level, which again, as I say, is incredibly difficult at a time like this. Yes, that's, that's right. And, and talking about how difficult it is, um, you can imagine in separations, I'm sure you've seen before, it's quite unpredictable about what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things you mentioned in uh, your, your recent blog and trauma parenting was about uh, developing brains don't like to have too much un unpredictability in daily life. So what are the, the, the small things you think parents can do to, to try and address that? Well, very, very important is the handovers. Uh, you know, often, often a time of conflict and children hate that, you know, they're already anxious. So they're anxious when they leave whoever the, the person is they spend the most time with because they're parting from them and they're, and they're worried. You know, I remember my son, when he used to come back, he would want to know exactly what I've been doing when he, he was away. You know, he really wanted to know the detail because he was obviously thinking about me all the time as I was him. Um, so that's, it seems to be one of the, it is one of the hardest things, the handover and the collection, you know, if you can't do it, then find somebody who can, because that has such an impact on a child, bad enough that, that 
the parents are not getting on or, or you know whoever, whoever the main people are in their lives but then they have to relive that over and over and over again so if you focus on nothing else really really focus on that and with older children do not be sharing text messages from the other side try not to be pulling them into the drama so that's not to say that you don't find um a simple way of explaining what's going on because they they will know but they don't need to know how bad or annoying the other person is or that they've let them down um it's really about holding them emotionally through this process if they want to say oh you know mummy's horrible or daddy's this or it's just you know, being curious and saying, oh gosh, that, that sounds really hard for you to have those feelings. Do not jump into bed with them. It, it won't It won't help the child. Just hold and acknowledge the feelings. Sure. Uh, that's what they really want. They might be testing you out to see if you're going to be mean about the other side, you know. They just don't need any of this stuff. Bad enough they've lost one of you or you've separated. That's more than enough. Yes. So thinking positively then, um, you, you've obviously been involved in this work for a, a huge number of years now. Where, uh, I'm wondering if you've had experiences where, with parents who have concentrated on the types of things you've been talking about and have seen changes in their children. Yeah, I... <laughs> not that many if I'm honest I was gonna <laughs> yeah. well just because because it's it's I mean I remember myself you know it is so terrifying on a practical basis you know there I was I, I had a young child I didn't have really a source of income and I had two dogs and nowhere to live so you're really not at your best to be fair yeah. um, I think that even though some of the stuff I did was not great I, I did not badmouth my son's father to him and um, I tried to really focus on my son's emotional needs I didn't get it all right and you know I can honestly hand on my heart say he he came through it very well very well and we always had the same ritual to reconnect when he came home so we always read the same book we always did the same thing so that was that like settling in and I tried to never hold him accountable for coming back and saying maybe unkind things to me or speaking in a disrespectful way you have to be bigger than that and then your children will come well who come through it well it's really about focusing on your relationship with them and your emotional connection and holding of them through this and they will come through you know the research would show you that it's always about the relationship that's the thing that gets our children through all all the bumps in life yes and i've, I've seen you talk about distraction before and how the, uh, the conflict with the other parent can get in the way of that. Um, it, it's obviously very easy for us to say, you know, try not to concentrate on that as much, but you're, you're saying it's vitally important. It really, really is. And um, yeah, it, it's the most important thing is try, you know, even if you write up somewhere this is for the long haul or you find a picture of a long road and you pin it on your fridge or somewhere and um amazingly we do all survive practically we survive all these things even if even if you end up pretty much with nothing which i did you know i was technically homeless um you, you will you will come through it and look look for the bits in you already that show you well i've survived this so look for the evidence of how far you've come. But, you know, I can't emphasize enough. And, you know, my, my son and I have been through many difficult things um, together. And my, in my not perfect way, but always trying to prioritize our relationship and keep that strong has been the thing that's got us through. So, you know, the stuff is the stuff. I mean, I've, I've had people say to me, oh, well, I'm not letting them have this and I'm not letting them have that. And, and I say, do you know what? The sooner you resolve all this stuff, the better, because it's getting in the way of you and your child's future. And stuff is stuff, you'll get more stuff. Yes. So, you know. Exactly. It's just stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it's <laughs> what do you think your, your take-home message would be for um, parents locked in conflict uh, at separation? see your child like really see them emotionally see them emotionally feel them and prioritize your relationship with them ask yourself the question 
by being awkward about contact, by being half an hour late back, how is this helping my child? How will this serve my child if I behave like this? Really, if, if you always ask your question, yourself that question, you won't go far wrong. Excellent. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much uh, for your time today, Jane. It's been enlightening as always. Um, and uh, I would certainly highly recommend those uh, watching and listening to check out Jane's TED Talk um, and her work on thejaneevans.com. Uh, and you mentioned a book earlier. What's the, the name of your book that's coming out? Uh, the little book that's coming out is is goes perfectly with the TED talk in a way that I didn't plan, but don't tell anybody. It's <laughs> called uh, Little Meerkats Big Panic. It's on Amazon and, and all the online stores. And it literally will walk you through the, the brain, but using cute little animals. Excellent. Sounds sounds amazing. Um, so for those that have been watching and listening, this has been video cam and audio cam. <laughs>